I'm Mark Freeman from the Department of Psychology, uh, as well as the Arts Transcending Borders program. Uh, and I want to welcome you to today's panel discussion on Anne Frank, Otto Frank, and the creation of memory. Um, I also want to give a special welcome to Roger Gwenweir Smith. In the initial write-up for the panel, we called attention following Roger's lead to the figure of Otto Frank. Anne Frank's father, who would bring her diary to the world and who had done much throughout the years to keep his cherished daughter's memory alive. The story sounds simple in some ways, but as it turns out, it's really not. And so we wanted to pose questions, including the following. This is from the initial write-up. How did Otto's editing and promotion of Anne's story come to shape the image that readers, theater goers, and film audiences would eventually see? How did this image and its reception come to shape the larger collective memory of the Holocaust? And how might we understand the extraordinary currency Anne Frank's story came to acquire? And what might this say about the fashioning and the refashioning of Holocaust memory? There's another source of questions too, namely those tied to this year's theme in the Arts Transcending Borders program, which is about originality and its origins. So we have some questions in that context too. What is the nature of originality? How does creative work in the arts, sciences, and beyond come into being? How does the work of others inform one's own? When is drawing upon the work of others legitimate? And when might it be harmful? Some of this year's focus has been on inspiration. One may be moved by the work others have done and through creativity, creative transformation, seeks to extend it in some way. Such influences, though, can also assume the form of appropriation. Others' work may be removed from its original context and used in the service of one's own ends, thereby possibly doing violence to the originating people or cultures. I'm guessing that we'll be discussing some of those issues here today. Now, since the time that we formulated all these questions, um, those of us on today's panel have done a good deal of additional reading and thinking about Anne Frank, Otto Frank, and what we're here calling the creation of memory. And now that we have Roger Gwynmere Smith's extraordinary performance behind us, we have that much more to think about and talk about. Um, so let's begin. Joining Roger on today's panel is Tom Doughton, senior lecturer in the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies, Ed Iser from the Department of Theater, and Teresa McBride from the Department of History. It's great to have you all here. Uh, to begin, I just wanted to offer a public thank you uh, to Roger for at least two things. Um, first, uh, a moving piece of art. Um, one that served to remind me, remind us, what can be learned through the kind of embodied, poetically charged work that you presented last night. Uh, images that spark, as you put it at one point. There were lots of those, and as a result, I, we, we did a lot of thinking and also a lot of feeling. I thank you for that. Um, I also thank you for helping me see how I'd managed to buy into some of the prevailing storylines and portraits of Otto Frank as sanitizer of his daughter's diary, for instance, as Natalie dressed bourgeois popularist, and so on. And what happened is I think I kind of lost sight of the human at the center of it. Hate the human at the center of it. Um, that doesn't mean that I'll ignore entirely some of the common wisdom uh, about Otto Frank. What it does mean is that I need to learn more. I need to go beyond the common wisdom and beyond what I know or what I think I know and see who's there um, or who might be there. Um, we know very little of Otto Frank. You said at one point in the talk back, and speaking for myself, I'll simply say, I think you're right, um, and it's good to be reminded of it. So I thank you for that, too. Um, you know, in a way, I guess I see what you're trying to do with Otto Frank as being similar um, to what some others have tried to do with Anne Frank. Um, 
That is to make her more appropriately complex, more multi-dimensional. So we'll talk about that in a little bit too. Um, to get our conversation started, I figured that we might just briefly go around uh, and say a few words about what you do, what you're hoping to contribute to today's discussion, um, even if the exact trajectory of the discussion has yet to be determined. Um, so if you could say a little bit about your interest or connection to the topic at hand, the kind of work you've done that speaks to today's topic, the kind of questions you have, that would be great. Um, and then I'll say a few more words to provide some additional context. So who wants to begin? Somebody put the microphone in front of you. <laughs> Hello. Is that on? No. Now is it on? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm Teresa McBride. I'm in the history department. And I think I do have to explain what my relationship to the topic and to this event is, uh, because I do come at it from a distinctive perspective. Uh, and it is more out of the teaching of uh, the Holocaust, uh, among other topics, uh, rather than having done any primary research of my own. Uh, but I do teach a course, for example, called, which I should call, uh, Memories of War, uh, because it includes the, the Second World War, the Holocaust, and the resistance. And I use just diaries and autobiographies. Um, but also <clears throat> because I teach the history of France and the history of Italy, which are two very distinctive experience, or had two very uh, distinctively national um, experiences uh, in terms of how the Holocaust um, played out uh, in those two places. For one thing, France was the only country in uh, Europe which actually signed an armistice with uh, the German state. So they were at peace with Germany throughout this period, and the, at least part of France remained unoccupied for half the war, so that it was a French government policy as well as a Nazi state policy. Um, and in terms of Italy, of course, it's the issue of the, the Vatican uh, in Rome, uh, the presence of the head of the Catholic Church there, uh, and, and the conflict around, or, or con uh, certainly the controversy around uh, the role of the Catholic Church uh, in this period. And, and although officially fascist, uh, Mussolini never deported Jews in the period in which he was in power, which does not mean to say that he didn't intern them uh, and expect them to um, disappear. So um, I, I don't really teach the Holocaust in that sense. I don't teach uh, Central Europe. Um, and instead, I teach modern France, modern Italy, and those. And I'm interested in the comparative work, uh, which is why I would, I would argue for a multiplicity of voices uh, and also uh, for some at least understanding of the distinctiveness of, of the way in which uh, this, this um, murderous strategy played out, so. Teresa, how, how did you come to use diaries in the Memories of War course? Uh, I, I kind of fell into it because there are fascinating ones. There are yeah, yeah. many, many, many diaries. Um, and some of them are published, some of them uh, were the result of rewriting by survivors after the war. Um, you know, they, they certainly range. There are very few diaries uh, which are published right after the war, uh, actually, because who wanted to read about it was the attitude of most publishers. Even Primo Levi found that. Mm -hmm. um, when he returned uh, from Auschwitz. Um, mostly these are, uh, they're also, some are fragmentary, they weren't finished, they weren't re-edited or reworked because uh, their writers did not survive. But, but I find it, it, it both engages students very well uh, mm -hmm. and provides an historian with, with that multiplicity of voices. So it's not one distinctive experience or, uh, or even a single, singular national experience, but really uh, a whole variety uh, of people in the way in which they experienced this or, or participated in it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and if I do, you know, I also try to use voices of those who, who participated, but those are even rarer, of course. Okay. Is this on working? Working? Working. Okay. I'm Thomas Doten. I've been teaching through the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies for, oh my goodness, 20 years now. Seems like forever. Um, and um, I teach an upper level seminar each spring entitled The Holocaust, which is a systematic interdisciplinary um, approach to the topic. And separate from that, um, with my colleague, Professor Daniel Batran, who is here. Um, we have been taking students on a Maymester in Europe entitled History, Memory, and the Holocaust in Central Europe. We spend time in Lithuania, Poland, the Czech Republic, and Germany, specifically interrogating the relationship between memory and history in Central Europe, which is becoming even increasingly um, contested and controversial. This year is going to be very different for us for a variety of reasons that have to do with the tension between what happened and what is remembered, by whom, for what purpose, mm -hmm. in what way. Um, my coming to this topic has a lot to do with the fact that I also teach diaries and um, there are roughly 100 diaries produced by young people during the Holocaust. I use this collection, which is entitled Salvage Pages, which represents a significant number of diaries from all over occupied Europe at the time. And um, most of these works are written by people in their teens, uh, or early 20s and speak powerfully, I think, to students on this campus. So because of this general interest in diaries as part of pedagogic strategies I use, I would obviously be really interested in Anne Frank. Um, I should say I do not teach Anne Frank, nor do I teach Knight which seems to be the two works that students come into class knowing. So for a variety of reasons, uh, this is a topic of interest to me personally and um, intellectually. I teach comparative genocide. I also teach Native American history and African American history. And um, it all sort of fits together for me, but separately. Um, you know, I'm one of the people who will argue that the Holocaust is not a metaphor for the transatlantic slave trade, for abortions, or any other situations. But pass this on to Ed. Hi, I'm Ed Iser, and um, I've been dealing with Holocaust literature for almost 35 years. And in, and I'm just going to give you a little brief overview of my scholarship because it'll illustrate the questions that have obsessed me for that period. Uh, my doctoral dissertation was entitled The Possible, the Probable, and the Ineffable. And it was a, obviously, dissertation said so to be highly theoretical. And it was an examination of um, aesthetics going back to classical aesthetics, and particularly Aristotle's notion that drama had to be something that was possible probable that we could identify and understand. And of course, the third piece of my doctoral dissertation title was the ineffable. So how can you make something possible and probable that's beyond the human imagination? So that was the first theoretical question that obsessed me. The second theoretical question that obsessed me was the representation of violence. 
um, the conundrum of the necessity for the representation of violence in uh, some, uh, any kind of enactment about the Holocaust, and yet the impossibility of representing violence or the danger of representing violence, because it either will turn an audience off to the point where they don't want to listen, or even worse, it'll titillate the audience and it becomes almost kind of porn pornography of violence. And, and for all we know, people in the audience are actually getting off on it. So there's all kinds of conundrums there. Um, and so those were the two theoretical questions that informed my early scholarship. And then that eventually became a book that was entitled Stages of Annihilation, in which I looked at about 120 different Holocaust plays, trying to discern patterns and seeing how my theoretical frame would allow us to analyze these plays. Um, and I, I won't take too much time with you, but one thing that came very clear to me in my study of Holocaust drama was that almost every single Holocaust play has some form of, I don't want to use the word agenda, but it's certainly a Rorschach test of the perspective of the artist. And there seems to be two main camps in Holocaust representation, or two pol polarities. One I would call the universalist position, which is one of the humanistic, ecumenical, universalist position uh, that the Holocaust is a part of European history and is one of many uh, examples of man's inhumanity to man. That's what we call the universalist position. The other is a much more particularist position, which asserts that the Holocaust is a unique historical event and that any representation of it has to include some reference to Yiddishkeit, uh, to Jewish culture, to the world that's been destroyed, to uh, the Hebrew language, to uh, religious practice, and uh, to see it in the context of the Jewish history, Jewish philosophy, um, and so again, this is a very particular point of view. And one can kind of adjudicate where almost any representation of the Holocaust falls in that framework. Anyway, those are the, the questions that have, I have a whole series of questions because I really have no answers off after all these years. And so whenever I see a show like last night, I bring these questions to it and I'm looking for a magical answer. Um, and, and watching how an artist has to grapple with these issues, which seems inherent to any Holocaust representation. Do you want to add anything, yeah. Roger? Oh, I spoke for an hour last night. Yeah. <laughs> Were any of you there last night? <laughs> Raise your hand. Good. Okay, thank you so good, much good. for coming. I'm Roger Gen yeah. <clears throat> Genver Smith, and uh, it's good to um, return to Holy Cross and to be in the midst of uh, such distinguished scholars and uh, scholars in the making. And that means all y'all. Um, Last night was a special experience um, to be able to present what we had talked about um, and uh, to have a go at it, to open uh, this vessel up to hopefully some inhabiting spirits uh, and um, in conjunction with a very rapt audience a very attentive audience to try to create a moment of, uh, of truth and uh, dare I say reconciliation, I don't know. I think that that's a question that we have to address um, when we look in the mirror. Uh, the process of creating this work uh, is a long one. Uh, I began uh, as an American studies major, as an undergraduate, and thought I might pursue a PhD in history at Yale. And uh, along the way, on a lark, I auditioned for this thing called the Yale School of Drama, and I was accepted, and I've been combining my interests uh, ever since. So I know how to uh, fashion a footnote, um, but I hopefully also know how to fashion a piece of e emotional uh, truth. And in combining those challenges, uh, I have found a particularly uh, rich subject in Otto Frank. I did a piece here uh, previously uh, inspired by Rodney King, uh, who was notoriously beaten by the Los Angeles Police Department. The videotape of that beating by officers Kuhn, Powell, Racino, and Wind uh, did not indict those officers. Um, those officers were allowed to walk out of a uh, 
out of a courtroom in Simi Valley, Los Angeles uh, in 1992. And they walked into a city uh, that would very quickly uh, became, become embroiled in one of the largest uh, civic uh, disturbances in our country's history. Rodney King was uh, beaten some uh, 56 times uh, by the LAPD and 56 people uh, lost their lives in that uh, conflagration. Um, the story of Rodney King brought me to Worcester, Mass, right here at uh, Holy Cross, and it also took me to Amsterdam. Uh, where I participated in a great theater festival, and I was able to go to the Anne Frank House, uh, which um, reignited uh, an interest that I had had in the story of Anne Frank and, and her father, uh, Otto. And when I walked into that uh, very, I think, sacred space, it was uh, very moving and it was very disturbing. I thought that it would be a lot more um, solemn than it was. There's a lot of multimedia flashing at you. In fact, there are interviews with Otto Frank that you were kind of forced to encounter in, in a space that I thought would be very dark and very silent. And as in all museums, as you exit, right. there's an opportunity to buy all kinds of right. things, including a replica of Anne Frank's uh, diary. Uh, and uh, that, to me, was, uh, was disturbing. But I'm sure within uh, the purview of the Anne Frank Foundation and something that they thought uh, was appropriate. So who am I to argue? But I was affected. Um, I have had the opportunity to uh, travel throughout the Northeast uh, where I have been uh, in collaboration with uh, students and scholars uh, at Keene State uh, in New Hampshire and then up at um, Augusta State in Maine and both of those uh, institutions have Holocaust uh, study uh, programs and also uh, a center in, um, in Augusta and uh, in uh, Keene as well. So how wonderful to uh, be in this uh, regional uh, uh, process and uh, to be in conversation with you uh, this afternoon. Thank you so much for having cool. me. Great to have you here. Um, just a, a, a few brief words about what landed me here. Um, I am, among other things, a student of memory and narrative, uh, especially as related to memoirs, autobiographies, and, and other life stories. Um, and I also teach courses like the psychology of good and evil. Um, and in recent years, I've extended my reach a bit to issues of cultural memory in the Holocaust and beyond and the varied ways in which cultural memory along with personal memory gets reworked and reshaped over the course of time, often in line with some present day interest or motive. Um, so if there's one point I'd like to put out there for our consideration, it's precisely this idea of the creation of memory. So why don't we take this up for a bit and see where it takes us. Um, I'm going to frame the first part of our discussion in terms of what might be called, in fact, what has been called um, the ethics of memory. Um, and I want to provide a little bit of context just to set the stage, and then it'll turn into a full-blown conversation. Um, in some accounts of Anne Frank's story, um, people have bemoaned its optimistic nature, or at least its partially optimistic nature. Given how she actually died, um, a gruesome, horrifying death by typhus in the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, it's been said that the diary, quote, cannot count as Anne Frank's story because we don't have an ending. And that if we had her actual ending more visibly in view, we would have a very different sense of her life, perhaps one truer to the grim realities she and countless others 
had to endure in the camps. A story may not be said to be a story, Cynthia Ozick has said, and this is from a piece in the New Yorker back in 1997. A story may not be said to be a story if the end is missing. For Ozick, therefore, and it's a critical piece, quote, a deeply truth-telling work has been turned into an instrument of partial truth, surrogate truth, or anti-truth, the consequence being nothing less than what she calls the subversion of history. It's one, she adds, that allows us, quote, to stew in an implausible and ugly innocence. And Otto Frank, it turns out, these are her words, um, is, quote, complicit in this shallowly upbeat view by virtue of what she calls the accommodationist revisioning that he undertook. As for the result, Ozick writes the image of Anne Frank as merry and steadfast idealist ultimately proved to be ineradicable. Um, so what we currently have, she tells us, and it's a strong statement, we'll have to decide whether it's too strong, what we ultimately have is the conversion of Anne Frank into usable goods. I'm reminded here of a conversation I had many years ago with Lawrence Langer, um, a well-known Holocaust scholar. At one point, I mentioned to him that I sometimes taught Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. Some of you probably know the book. And that book is, among other things, a celebration of sorts of the human spirit um, in the form of the capacity to access one's spiritual freedom, one's inner freedom, even in such dreadful circumstances as the concentration camp. Everything can be taken away from a person, Frankel argues in the book, except this freedom, this capacity to choose to say no. I will not be defeated by these utterly horrific circumstances. I can't change the circumstances, but I can change how I relate to them. I can change my attitude toward them. Anyway, as it turns out, Langer deplored the book um, and deplored that line of thinking. Basically, if I understood him right, because in his view, there is simply no room for a redemptive story of any sort in the context of the Holocaust not given the depths of horror and degradation it involved. Um, and, and for all I know, and I don't say this as a criticism, I'm just thinking back of Langer's words, for all I know, um, he may have had some similar thoughts about a couple of the words that you used. And I'm thinking especially of the two words that you highlighted last night, promise and hope, right? Um, and so, in any event, to make a long story short, as another writer, uh, Thomas Larson, put it in an article, um, it's, quote, time to get away from the noble and poisonous appropriation Anne Frank's work has suffered. So serious stuff. There's a lot of serious critical work out there. So a few questions <laughs> surface here, and I want to just read them, <clears throat> and then let's try to take them on one by one. First. How widely circulated is this kind of upbeat image of Anne Frank that these critics, among many others, are referring to? Um, and also, this would be especially, I think, for Tom and Teresa, um, how does the Anne Frank story, the Anne Frank image, how does it compare to the other images and stories that are out there um, on the part of other diarists? memoirists and so on. So that's one question. Second, assuming there's some validity to the line of criticism I just outlined, did Otto Frank play a role in advancing this more upbeat rendition? And if so, how might we understand his motives? Seen from one angle, there's the aforementioned idea, and it's one that's commonly used, the idea of sanitizing, the sanitization of her story, right? Editing some things out that might have been a bit too difficult, at least for some members of the reading public, right? Seen from another angle, though, I think it could be argued, it has been argued, that he wanted to get the word out to as many people as it, he possibly could, even if this meant some relatively small measure of creative editing, let's say. 
Um, and in, in terms of uh, Amsterdam, just a very, very quick story. Um, when our younger daughter was 12, we were living in Spain for the year and for her birthday, that's where she wanted to go. She wanted to go to the Anne Frank Museum and I don't remember whether she got any trinkets as she left and so forth. Um, and, and I, like you, had a similar kind of response, the commercialization of it, the commodification of it and so on. But there is the other side of it too, um, which is to say, she learned something that she wouldn't have otherwise learned had that place not existed, had she not read the diary of Anne Frank, and so on. And so there's a part of me that wants to say, how could that not be a good thing? Now, it may not be the best thing. <laughs> I get that, but, you know, She's 30 years old now. When I told her I was doing this panel, um, she read up on Anne Frank. She's still, she's still into it. Um, the other thing I would want to say, at least kind of partially in defense of Otto, um, is that whatever else we might know or say about him, he lost a child um, and others. And it stands to reason that he would want to keep her. He would want to preserve her in some way. And so I'll, I'll be curious to know where we are on that. I mean, and the, the idea isn't to kind of just guess his motives, but to just think about that constellation of issues. Um, third, and more to the point still, and then we can open it up, what sort of memory or memories of the Holocaust should we have, right? And what sort of portrayal, if any? Right? Um, is there some sort of proper representational path here? And if so, what might that be? So let's deal with the diaries issue. I'll jump in early and then Go. move everything else through. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to get a water. No, I'm good. Um, uh, um, actually, the day that Tom um, Landy had emailed me and asked me to join this panel, um, which I, I agreed to thinking, as I think he was, that this is, we're talking about the diary of a young girl. Uh, we definitely should at least consider um, the, the gendered experience here. On that very day, I'd read in the New York Times, and I went back to it and, and ripped it out and, and kept it since then, uh, about a Japanese author, novelist I hadn't heard of before. Um, Yoko Agawa, who had been remembered reading Anne Frank's diary as a teenager and was so inspired by it that she wrote letters to Anne uh, as if she were a living person, a friend. And that had reminded me of Otto Frank talking about that that girls would write Anne Frank letters, and I don't know whether they encouraged this as a as a program when you come to the Anne Frank house, or right. that they these were spontaneous. Uh, but I thought about that connection a lot uh, since being asked to be on the panel, and actually the Agawa's creative use of the Anne Frank diary. Some years later, when she was in her 30s, she wrote a novel uh, in which she she kind of digested Anne Frank, uh, the diary, and her experience as she understood it, and then used that. Not, it's an interesting comparison to what you did, Roger, which was to take a real historical person, someone with you know, very um, intimate connection, uh, important connection to Anne, uh, but instead to um, take the idea of a, a writer, uh, who has to write in secret and has to be uh, sequestered. Um, it's, it's on an island which has, doesn't have any Japanese characteristics, so it's kind of nameless island, and none of the characters have names. They're a, a novelist and an editor and so forth, and the novelist is, is hiding the editor. Um, so she, she really has taken the concept of the writing a diary, writing uh, for herself, uh, and, and used that, but inspired by Anne Frank. Um, so that was kind of my, my lead into the panel itself, is, is where, 
what therefore that does for us in terms of, I mean, I think it's, on one hand, I would say, you know, the, the creative um, use of this work, since it is really very much in the common, um, common mind, common, of common use, uh, while used um, what, with, with respect is still, you know, is open to uh, interpretation, I would say. You know, her use of it is, is also, seems to be, I haven't read the novel, uh, but seems to be also, um, while ahistorical, um, you know, taking it out of a particular set of circumstances, seems to be a very effective way of expressing something about this, um, this relationship to writing uh, and to, um, uh, to uh, uh, that, that that sense of, of repression, uh, this island is is ruled by a government that that makes things disappear overnight and then makes the memories disappear, so you never know that you're actually missing something. Um, so it could be a very much a repressive regime, and in that respect. Um, so why, why diaries? I should have started uh, with this too. Um, they're not only compelling, but also um, you can cover you can cover more landscape with them. I think um, I have not taught the diary of Anne Frank. Um, I was trying to remember actually when I read it. I read it as a teenager. As I could I ask how many of you have read it? Mm -hmm. And of those of you who've read it, was it an assigned book, like in high school? Or? Okay, thank you. Um, and I did see the film. I remember the film very vividly. Um, I, I, I suppose I, I wouldn't use it just because it doesn't fit into the things that I do. Um, and I do try to use diaries and memoirs which are, are less edited, although I could use, I suppose, the critical edition at this point. But. Um, where did what, I want to go with what, that? What about the issue of her, her diary, its tenor, its mode, whatever, in relationship to the other mm. Holocaust diaries that you know? And I mm -hmm. want to hear from Tom, especially. I didn't know there were 100 mm -hmm. out there. Um, uh, but this one has yeah. risen mm -hmm. to the top. <laughs> it, well, I do have, you know, I have some other stories. I don't want to bog down the discussion. The, the stories I do you, which are the more fragmentary, they were interviews done well after the war uh, with people who all survived, um, but had very different experiences um, in France. Um, so Tom is really the expert on using these uh, adolescent or teenage young people's diaries. Uh, all of the diarists I used uh, were people who were adults and in very, very different circumstances, but not, mm -hmm. not wouldn't be the equivalent of yeah. Anne Frank. Okay, guess I'm next, then, right? Um, oh. I would, I would want to begin by um, drawing to your attention some information I just confirmed myself. And that is, between 1955 and the present, there have been over 26,000 works on the Holocaust produced in English versus 12,000 in German, um, 11,000 in Hebrew, and 4,200 in French. Now, between 1945 and 1955, however, there were 564 works in English on the Holocaust, 525 in Hebrew, 230 in German, and 193 in French. Now, obviously, this means that you know, we know a lot more about the Holocaust than we did um, when the text first appeared in English or the, the film version of this diary um, appeared. My concern in, and is to move away from some of the more general aspects of your question mm -hmm. to talk about what I see as one of the first important steps towards an Americanization of the Holocaust. Um, Anne Frank becomes, or I should say, Anna Frank 
becomes Anne Frank, the nice American girl living next door to everyone in the country in the mid-1950s, uh, which is certainly an appropriation. And that's part of why I don't use th this particular diary. But it also is, in fact, um, decontextualized to a certain extent. Um, I don't find, and I, I just recently went back and reread some sections of it myself, I don't find much of a sense of the Holocaust in this work. Um, so I'm not so sure why it has become the standard, as it were. There is a new text that has just appeared um, that is being compared to this diary, um, Renusia Spiegel. Um, I've read it and I find it really extraordinary um, and insignificant, to be honest about it, really trivial. And for it to be presented as the new Anne Frank in 2019 is for me amazing that it still is the standard that the marketing wants us to see Renusia Spiegel as another Anne Frank. And she is not for a variety of reasons. So that, you know, moving away from the more general question, right. I think there has been what some critics call an Americanization of the Holocaust. And the Anne Frank narrative is one of the first significant parts of this Americanization. So it's a text that troubles me because it decontextualizes a Jewish Holocaust. Mm -hmm. is, 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 do you think that that may be one of the reasons for its great success? Well, I think that is part of its great success, that Anne Frank is our neighbor. She lives next door to us in 1950s suburbia, and she is not Jewish. She's a nice American girl. And, you know, that, that's troubling, I think. That's an appropriation that makes her narrative problematic, where the narratives in salvage pages and some other anthologies are Jewish works produced by Jewish mm. people aware of their Jewishness. And I find that sense missing in Anne Frank's diary. And for me, it decontextualizes to an extent that the Americanization is a, uh, of the Holocaust in this work is a problem. Yeah. For me, it is. Have, have, as far away, I don't teach it. Just one follow-up. Have you come across other diaries that are much more rooted in the kinds of Jewish specific issues that you're talking about that could gain or could have gained a wide readership? Or would they just be destined to be in the background? Um, I suspect that many of these works remained in the background until the, the last decade. Yeah. They required um, a different comprehension, a different awareness of the Holocaust, um, and an awareness that moved us away from the standard divisions of rescuers, victims, perpetrators, and mm. bystanders and standards. I think there needed to be an appreciation of Jewish agency, even in this suffering, before other diaries could mm. be acceptable, because they are so radically different okay. from the Anne Frank narrative. Mm -hmm. But they do show a different agency, I think. Yeah a Jewish agency, which I find lacking in the Frank text. Mm -hmm. And it became more apparent as I was reading it in the past few weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to just kind of extrapolate on that point. Um, what does art and literature do? Art and literature creates collective memories. It becomes a way for us to process the world around us. It also becomes a way for us to understand the past. And so in many ways, art and literature, by forming a collective narrative, 
can also form a historical narrative. Uh, and this is, is kind of a postmodern idea. I mean, history is a narrative. It's history, yes, we correct, collect evidence, and then we tell a story. We edit it, we shape it. Um, so the question of kind of the differentiation between art, literature, and history is, is a little less firm than it might have, we might have thought decades ago. So if we accept the notion that art and literature, in fact, is creating a historical narrative, then we're, we kind of go back, I hate to get theoretical, and you go back to the issue that was articulated by Plato, which is that art can be extremely dangerous. Art can teach really bad lessons. And this leads me to my next point, just to engage Roger here. Roger's now reminded me twice that he knows how to write a footnote. Um, and that he's creating a work of art. And so in my looking at a whole series of both literature and drama, I think one of the things we have to look at as critics is the relationship between the enactment or the literary work and the historical narrative. And that is a mode, I think, of analysis is does, in fact, the artist uphold the ethical and moral obligation in understanding that they are creating a narrative that becomes the story of the historical past. And therefore, the artist has an ethical and moral obligation, perhaps not to write footnotes. It, it, it's a work of art. It has to be, as Bertolt Brecht said, both entertaining and teaching. Um, but I think it's a valid question to ask any artist who writes on this topic or any other really intense historical subject, how close are you to the historical narrative? Uh, how much of this is poetic license, how much of this is invented? Because those inventions have consequences. Those inventions shape the collective memory. Therefore, those narratives collect, create the historical narrative for future generations. So a work of art is a historical document. And this is very interesting when you look at plays written in 1946 versus plays written in 2006 and their take on the historical event. Anyway, I'll turn it over to you, Roger. What, just a qu quick question. Yeah. What, what about the idea, I mean, and maybe you're going to deal with this. The term that Roger had mentioned before was emotional truth, mm -hmm. which is to say his aim was less to create an historical narrative by all indications, but to create something with a certain kind of emotional power that didn't aspire, let's say, mm -hmm. to the kind of historical fidelity that you're talking so about. So that's I Aristotle's response to Plato. <laughs> so what Aristotle said to Plato was that history is merely a collection of facts. But art, now art, can reveal the underlying truth. So the question you have to, again, because it, putting on a critic's hat looking at last night, um, did Roger tap into a profound emotional truth and did it take us on an emotional journey and did it deeply touch us and bring us closer to that world in a kind of sensual, and I mean in, in the sense of feeling, perhaps what Otto Frank experienced. That's one question and the other question is how does it relate to the historical documentation. I think there are two separate questions there. Okay. And one can achieve okay. one without achieving the other. One would hope in the ideal work you would achieve both. At least as a critic, that would be my yeah. frame of reference. Cool. Have at it. Yeah, go for it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a couple of nights ago, um, in referencing the story of the DC Holocaust Museum um, shooting and killing June 10th, 2009, security guard Stephen Tyrone Johns lost his life, an 88-year-old self-proclaimed white supremacist and racist um, shot him in cold blood as he welcomed him into the museum. I tell a little story of that tragedy in, in this piece. Um, and I said that when the murderer went to the hospital, his life was saved by a Jewish doctor. And this is just something that I think I heard somewhere. And someone told me that. But I, I couldn't find it. 
I couldn't find it anywhere. I couldn't get documentation for it, so I withdrew right. it. Okay. Now, I had thought about maybe going the other way, and, you know, this guy goes to the hospital, he's been shot, and his uh, doctor is Sammy Davis Jr. Right. <laughs> That's a joke, y'all. <laughs> Sammy Davis Jr. was a black man who was also Jewish, and he only had one eye. Now you can laugh. <laughs> You're not too young to laugh, are you? So I didn't go either way with it, and I left it out, um, because I think that there is a responsibility that we have, even as artists who use poetic license. Mm -hmm. um, did Otto Frank have a conversation with a Japanese-American World War II vet? Maybe he could have but I don't have documentation of it, mm -hmm. but I thought that it might be instructive mm -hmm. that a man who fought with honors for the German army in World War I and then had that army turn on him and, and his family would have a conversation with a man who fought for the United States of America valiantly while his um, family was interred in now. May I say concentration camps? Is that allowed? May I say that? That those were concentration camps? That American people, American citizens were placed into? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have that license. That's another question sure. of appropriation. May I say if I'm being impeached that it's a lynching? Do I have permission to say that? <laughs> May a distinguished graduate of this college say that he's the victim of a high-tech lynching? Look it up. So appropriation, the use of language, the sensitivity to history, to experience, is something that is important. And it's important in Washington, D.C., and it's important right here in Worcester, Mass. And mm -hmm. sometimes those lines cross. Mm -hmm. um, our president said at the Mexican border not long ago that there is nothing more beautiful than barbed wire when used properly. And that's why we use barbed wire to advertise our show. Because we think that it's relevant in 1944, but we happen to think that it's relevant in this present moment. Which is why in this piece mm -hmm. we reference a father and a daughter on a border who drown. You know that story? You've seen that picture? You've seen that image? A man holding his daughter, trying to get across a river to the United States of America. They have left the daughter on one side of the river. He goes back to get his wife. The daughter panics. She goes out into the river. He leaves his wife on the other side of the river, goes to get his daughter, and they both drown. Do you know that story? You should. It's one of the most pervasive images of this year. This is what we have to invest in, not simply nostalgia, not simply a diary that was written umpteen years ago that you were required to read in your literature class in middle school or in high school. This is an issue right now, now. And the most effective thing in this whole story for me is a man who has lost his family.
his two daughters, and his wife. And then he has to negotiate that loss for the rest of his life, and he lives to a ripe old age, 91. And I heard Eva Schloss, who was his stepdaughter, his, he married her mother. They were survivors, lost her brother, lost her father. She's a woman who's 91 years old now. She's a contemporary of Anne Frank, and she spoke very movingly, very strongly. But one of the things that really hit me when she spoke was something that she told her stepfather. She told Otto, hey, Otto, you're focused too much on the dead. You need to focus more on the living. You have grandchildren now who need your attention. And I put that in the piece that you saw last night. So how does, how does one person negotiate loss? And how do we, as, as a civilization, negotiate loss? My God, today there's a truck full of nice corpses nice. In, the UK, yeah. in the UK. People trying to cross borders. For what? For opportunity, for a new life. We don't even know the identity of, of the lost people yet. We just knew that there, there was a truck full of dead people. Today, right now. So, yeah. did I respond to the question? Yeah. I don't, I mean, it, I don't it, know. it calls up or calls us back to what Ed had referred to as the particularism versus universalism issue. You know, the idea of the Holocaust as irreducibly singular and in a sense non-comparable. Um, and you know, so for those who would hold to that view, the idea of somehow making a connection to Bosnia or to Charlottesville or whatever might be construed as too much in the direction of a universalism um, or the UK or what have you. Uh, well, there's but a universalism of, right. of, of murder, right. which is an ongoing human you. issue since Cain and Abel, right? Right. right. And, and, and this is the thing that, that Otto Frank, for better or worse, railed against. I mean, I said it mm -hmm. last night in the piece, and I did a piece on Huey P. Newton, co-founder of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. But Otto Frank, in his correspondence with one of his, his, his many acolytes, said, hey, watch out for the Black Panthers and the Palestinians. It's an unholy alliance. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I'm certainly not trying to politically sanitize oh, Otto no, no, Frank no. Uh, no. at all. Yeah. And let me say this, the diary cannot be unread. Mm -hmm. right. It has been read and will continue to be read. And I don't know if any new, so-called new Anne Frank will ever supplant right. the, the, the Anne Frank that we think yeah. we know. Yeah. So we, we have to somehow make amends and, and understand the legacy of, of this vital piece of literature, whether, whether it serves our purposes or not. Yeah. And it's read in Japan. Nelson Mandela read it on Robben Island. Let me pass the yeah. mic. Teresa, shut up. Yeah, I was going to comment. Oh, sorry. Um, comment on, on Roger's performance in which I, th I thought among the most powerful elements was that focus on memory and what I understood <laughs> you were doing with that. Uh, and maybe it's because I'm older and I think about memory and decline of memory a lot. Um, but there's, there's collective memory, which we've been talking about as, as historians and, and um, humanists. But there's also individual memory. And the powerful um, emotional core is that this is a man who did 
as you say, lived to be 91. He had a long life. Most of that was after the war, in which because of publishing, editing his daughter's diary and publishing it and setting up an, a fund and a museum in the Anne Frank House, people came to him and he met people constantly, he was interviewed uh, continuously and told him stories. And many of the stories, not the ones that happened after his death, but many of the stories, many of the images um, that you were evoking, plausibly relate to Otto Frank as this figure who then became a kind of center for people expressing to him stories they thought he should know or they wanted to share with him. Uh, or whom he invited to share with him. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, then in combination with the fact, that I think you were doing this, maybe you weren't, I apologize. But as someone who, uh, at toward his, the end of his life, some memories have become much more vivid. Probably his attachment to his daughter and his, his loss of his entire family uh, and friends became even stronger um, and perhaps you know, even more traumatic. And then also at the same time, other things become vaguer. So you can't really remember who told me this or when I met someone. And I'm suggesting that, I thought that was a very powerful theme throughout, is that uh, focus on individual memory. I'd like to say something a little bit personal. Um, trying to understand the reason why Anne Frank was so popular, why it remains so popular. I have an interesting question, which is when did Jews become white? That's a provocative statement, but I want you to roll that around in your head for just a second. Because that's what Jews wanted. They wanted to be white. At least assimilationist, bourgeois Jews from Germany, like Otto Frank. That's what they want it to be. Um, and my generation, I was literally weaned on two breasts. One breast was the Holocaust. My mother is alive, she's 92. She's older than Anne Frank. This is not history in my family. The other nipple I was weaned on was Zionism. Um, and the thing is, we're not the Jews you want us to be. Um, the vast, vast majority of Jews are Zionist. The vast, vast majority of Jews are not assimilationist, at least not hardcore. Certainly maybe in the United States, but the majority of Jews around the world, they don't look like Ashkenazi European Jews. They don't speak like them. They would not particularly make you necessarily comfortable. Sorry. Anne Frank makes you very comfortable. And out of Frank, wanted to make sure you felt comfortable by removing any reference in the diary to Zionism, by removing specific references to Jewish ceremonies, by removing Hebrew. It was a conscious effort to make her a universal figure that would be easily identifiable and that you all would feel comfortable with. But she's not representative at all of the victims of the Holocaust, most of whom, and I used the term before, Yiddishkeit, they were of a culture, of a people that did not aspire to be enlightened Europeans. Not all Jews did, and they don't necessarily today. But they might make you uncomfortable. And so we want to embrace Anne Frank because that's what you'd like us to be. And unfortunately, it's what many of us wanted to be. And just to finish up, I have two brothers. One is named Stephen, the other is named Raymond. And my name is Edward. You can't get more waspy than that. <laughs> and my parents did that because we were all born in the 50s after World War II. My daughter is named Rachel, and my son is named Micah. And they were both Hebraic names. And so there's been a change among Jews, and particularly Israel has a huge role to play in this. And again, Anne Frank is perhaps what you want us to be, but it ain't who we are. Sorry. I have a nephew named Micah. Let me. Uh, <laughs> so, we got we got to move towards closing soon. Oh. Let me just. It's just what's what strikes me is um, 
is how different these respective projects are. I mean, Ed, your project really is an historical and cultural one, and the aim is to preserve the specificity of Jewish culture and memory and to locate what happened in the Holocaust, squarely in the Holocaust. Roger, it seems that you're less interested in the issue of memory and you're more interested in the present and the future in some way. And so in line with making these different points of contact with other sites of atrocity, your goal seems to be to move less into the past and to, in a sense, use some elements from the past in order to establish meaningful connections to what calls on us now in contemporary culture. And those are just very, very different projects. And well, that's a goal. Yeah. But m the present moment is always served and uh, illuminated by memory. And, um, you know, the first thing that, that we hear is uh, an ice cream truck version of happy birthday. Right. Uh, manipulated very skillfully by my colleague, Mr. Mark Anthony Thompson. And we must remember that the diary was a birthday gift from Otto to his daughter, Anna, on her 13th birthday. And I imagined that moment whereby a father says to his daughter, fill it with your dreams and your nightmares but by all means do try to live up to the meaning of your two given names, grace and God is my vow. And now I will wish you a happy, happy birthday, my child. You're a Gemini, star-crossed and stubborn and the apple of your father's eye. Even when he is blinded by a suppressed Teutonic rage, Right? So in playing towards our moment, right. I, I, I'm not afraid of, of memory and, and, and I, can, I do engage yeah. it. I, th I think that it's important. Yeah. Oh, okay. But I think that it's also important that we come to a particular conclusion which is how are we going to change the world when we walk out of this right. theater, when we walk out of this sacred place where we do dangerous work? How, how then are we going to maneuver? Are we going to simply say, wasn't it horrible what happened way back then? Mm -hmm. God, it was, it was horrible what they did to them, wasn't it? And my Otto says, you know, to those of you who, who say that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to deracinate you, to take the Jew out of you, it should not be of your concern if I want you to be played by Audrey Hepburn. Boo, she's not a Jew. And he did. He wanted Anne Frank to be played on screen by Audrey Hepburn. She wouldn't do it. Right? And he was hounded for many years by a man by the name of Meyer Levin, oh, yeah. who felt that he had been ripped off by Otto and right. by the people who eventually did the screenplay for the film, the same people who did It's a Wonderful Life. So this process of gentilization, is that a right, word? Right. <laughs> of, of this story, yeah. you know, it, it, it is, is something that, that Otto latched onto very early on in, in, in this process because he was initially engaged with Maya Levin, um, but, you know, took a step back and, and engaged mm -hmm. these other people and told this other story. You know, as you say, we look at the Anne Frank in the film, and she's like, you know, the girl next door. You know, she could be Becky, somebody, you know? So, um, yeah. Cool. Let's thank the panel and then open it up for some questions. Thank you. <laughs> we, have, we have lots more we could ask, but I think it's time for you all, so please. I have um, actually and questions to ask. Um, 
one of the things, and this is something I just, and I hope I just Oh, I'm sorry. One of the questions I have and this is a quick question, it's just curiosity on my fact, uh, my part. I was told that um, Otto Frank was a, a very close friend to Jacob Hyatt, and that Jacob begged him to come to Worcester to live. Is that true? Do you, because I've gotten that from a few people, but I don't, like you said, have documentary proof. I don't either, and I'm not gonna speculate okay. on that. The I do know that Otto Frank lived in New York City uh, as a young man. One of his best friend was a guy named Nathan Strauss, whose family owned Macy's. And um, so he Here's this back. curiosity, but I want to quickly, you, what is your name, Roger? Ed. Ed. <laughs> okay, I'm, I, Roger. I, I'm listening to you, and I went to Amsterdam myself. And I went, of course, to visit the Anne Frank house. I was all excited, you know. And I got on the, the trolley, and I'm sitting there, and um, there's this woman next to me, and this man right in front. And she said, um, are you enjoying yourself? I said, oh, yes, I went to the Anne Frank house. And she turns around to me, and he turned around, and he says, they had, a better, it, they had it better than any of us. That's not the true story. And that kind of upset me, not because I thought they were lying, but I do feel that there's a stepping stone. And I think Anne Frank gave us that stepping stone through her father, because as you mentioned, many of the young people, were, they were assigned. This was an assignment that we had to read Anne Frank. But through reading the Anne Frank, who appeared to us to be like a neighbor or someone we knew we could relate. And so we all need a stepping stone and then we start climbing. Okay, thank you. So I was intrigued by a question that was asked earlier that I don't think um, the panelists or, or Roger spoke to. And that is, can there ever be a redemptive story of the Holocaust? Right. I think that um, Ed's point is well taken when you gentilify, if there, <laughs> that is a word, right? If you make, <laughs> if you take the Jewishness out of the Holocaust, as uh, the story of Frank is told, a uh, redemptive story is more possible. Um, and that is the problem. You know, asking questions about what, what will we do when we walk out of here is an important question, but we have to be accurately informed. We can't walk away with a misimpression of what actually took place. Um, and I think that speaks loads to why it is that Anne Frank is um, so well read. Um, the same kind of criticism was um, levied against Primo Levi, actually, as a great apologist, because he too um, provides a way out for the oppressionists, although he is much closer to the truth, I would say. Um, like so that, that's, that's yeah. the danger. I, I just was wondering if you had thought about that at all in, in your production of, of Otto Frank. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, each, each line is... is uh, <laughs> Each line is filtered through any number of readings, any number of thoughts, any number of misgivings, miswritings, ed editing process, uh, dreams and nightmares and weird rhymes which come out of nowhere. Um, I take on this um, responsibility uh, whether I'm working with Otto Frank or Rodney King or Huey Newton or Christopher Columbus or any of the other um, solo performances that I've essayed. And I take on that responsibility and sometimes I take on, you know, tremendous uh, uh, criticism. Uh, I remember when I was doing Huey Newton in the Bay Area, uh, I was supposed to be uh, a guest on a radio uh, show, talk show, which was hosted by a former Panther. And uh, the host uh, came to see the show and then canceled the interview. And when asked why, uh, the host said, because of the drug references. Well, Huey Newton was murdered in front of a crack house. He was a crack addict. 
but there were certain elements um, after he died in the Bay Area, particularly, who didn't want to, to acknowledge that uh, degrading part of his, his life and, and demise. So in making choices, in, you know, um, in trying to construct these stories, there is always the risk of pissing somebody off <laughs> and not playing to an accepted agenda. I felt that um, what a lot of what Otto was saying in my piece was an answer to Ozick's article. No, I know. I, uh, that's how I took it. Yeah. No. Uh, to those no. of you know, to those of you who who feel that I have uh, no. concocted and no, I... and uh, and censored and summarily exploited with a ballpoint pen, which wasn't even invented when you were allegedly up in the secret annex confiding in your so-called dear kitty. Now, there are some people who try to prove that Anne Frank hadn't written the diary because oh, yeah. it was done in, with a ballpoint pen which didn't exist then. And Otto had to get scientific experts right. to testify in court <laughs> that in, that in fact wow. this was his daughter's handwriting. Wow. Can you imagine how painful that process must have been? When he was presented with that diary after the war, it took him months to read it. He couldn't do it. There's a famous picture of him in profile, which I talk about in the piece, in the annex, that was taken by an American photographer who was there with his wife, who just happened to be there the night that the Anne Frank house was opening. And Otto and his wife, very graciously gave them a tour. He took the photographs, and then a bell rang. And he said, that is the bell that Anna wrote about in the diary. And then he just completely broke yeah. down and lost it. And his wife said, please, 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 leave my husband alone. Can't you see that you're killing him? As I said earlier, I very much appreciated your restoring that kind of lost image or buried image of a suffering human being. Um, Dan, can I ask you a question? Um, for some reason, your question called forth uh, the, the title of a, a book by Barack Obama called The Audacity of Hope. And there's a certain sense in which what you were saying led me to think that hope itself in this context is simply out of place. In other words, that's not where we need to go at all vis-a-vis -vis the Holocaust. So where do we need to go? I mean, that was one of the questions. Where do we need to go if not in, the, in any direction of hope? That's a, that's a very strong question. I mean, uh, you know, uh, to say one has lost hope is to, to lose meaning in life, right? So that's not the appropriate response. But by the, yeah. by the same token, uh, and this is something I wanted to mention earlier, um, the root of the word Holocaust is itself incredibly offensive uh, to the memory of those who died. As I understand it, the term means a burnt offering. That in and of itself suggests that the Jewish people were offered uh, to God for redemptive purposes. In the Jewish Bible, the temple had many sacrificial offerings. A burnt offering was only offered 
by those who sinned, unintentionally, but who sinned nonetheless. The implication of the word goes back to the crucifixion, where Jesus Christ is crucified because of man's sins. Except here we're dealing with an entire people. That's problematic. That kind of hope is a false hope. Right. Uh, that kind of redemptive theme is not only false, but as I said, is right. offensive to the memory of those who perished. Huh. Huh. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Yeah. Hi. So I interpreted <clears throat> part of when you were like walking up here talking as a comparison of the Holocaust to um, like stuff that's going on in the border, other Monday events. And to me, it just in my opinion, I'm not a history <coughs> student, I think that's a very whitewash on the many different injustices we have going on around the world. Because when you take the Holocaust and compare it to people at the border, to other genocides, you're taking away the person responsible. You're saying, oh, like how humans can be so off the humans. It's not humans, it's specifically Nazis, white people, white supremacists, racists, and Republicans. Those are the people yeah. committing the crimes. I know that is a hard statement, but that is just yeah. how I feel. And, and so Roy Cohn. I think and it's Roy very Cohn. dangerous to make these comparisons because it's from very white perspective and it's only benefiting the white people. It's not benefiting those who have been hurt and those who have undergone the trauma. So I was just curious what your perspective is on that. Did you see the performance last night? I unfortunately could not make it. Yeah, okay. Um, my father was born in Jim Crow, Virginia. Okay. He was an outstanding student who was accepted to study law at the University of Virginia. He submitted a photograph for his matriculation and he was immediately rejected because it was determined that he was a man of color. He married my mother. They went to a motel in Los Angeles, tried to get a room and they were denied accommodation in California because they felt that they were a mixed couple because my father was a brown-skinned man, my mom was very fair-skinned. But they didn't know that my mom had black stamped on her birth certificate in Charleston, South Carolina. And they didn't know that my father was an attorney who made a living by suing places like that motel who didn't accommodate black and brown people. They sued the motel. They took the money that they won in the settlement and they built their own motel about three blocks away and took their business away from them. And this is where my father had his law office and where my mom eventually had her dental office. And it's where I had my first job. Now, the story of my family is not a unique one. It is unfortunately a story which can be told over and over and over again in this country and in other countries as well, where people have been denied opportunity, have been denied comfort, have been denied the opportunity to raise and care for their family, because of their race, their color, their religion, their orientation, et cetera, et cetera. That this story of Anne Frank and Otto Frank should be 
in communication with other stories, I think, is appropriate. Does it supplant the story of the so-called Holocaust? No, it does not, of course. This is unique in the annals of human degradation in the same way that the Middle Passage is, or the story of Bosnia, or the story of Rwanda, or the umpteen stories throughout the ages and in the ages to come. So, no, I don't think that uh, I'm trying to whitewash anything. Um, if anything, I'm trying to blackwash it. <laughs> yeah, and what's really problematic is that your president said he's being lynched. That's problematic. And it's problematic when he says that barbed wire is, is the most beautiful thing that he's ever seen when used properly. That's problematic. And what's problematic is that we have an election coming up in 2020 where the future of this country is going to be determined, y'all. That's problematic. And that's my passion. That's what I do. And that's how I do it. And I know that you're doing your thing. And you have stood up. And you have told me how you feel. And I have done the same. Thank you. Thank you. And with that. <laughs> you wipe your hand, OK. Hey. <laughs> All right. Oh, also, your president flipped off uh, an astronaut, <laughs> a Jewish astronaut. Thanks for being here. And thanks again to our panel. Okay. <laughs>